Hi, I'm Rick Harvey. I'm a technical evangelist here at AWS, and I've got some great guests here today to talk to us about core container technology. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, so um, over to you. All right, and my name's Roland Singh, and I'm co-founder and lead developer of Skywatch Space Applications. Hi, I'm Sarah Wells. I'm technical director for operations and reliability at the Financial Times. Okay, so um, do you want to give me a brief uh, breakdown of what you use containers for? Well, uh, Skywatch, uh, what we do is we aggregate the world's Earth observation data collected by satellites, and we make it easy to find and easy to use. So that involves, that involves a lot of work uh, dealing with large files, um, and uh, from the beginning we decided that our application was going to be serverless microservices based architecture. Um, as we got into it, it became very evident though that some of the, some of the uh, files that we were dealing with uh, from our satellite providers were going to be too big to be able to process inside of a Lambda function. Um, you know, not enough memory or not enough local storage or not enough running time. So we were going to use ECS, but then Fargate was announced. Um, and we jumped right into Fargate. We were an early adopter almost right from the beginning. Um, and we found, it, we found it really, really useful to be able to process those large workloads and still maintain our, our, our serverless microservices architecture. I think that's a great use case for like serverless versus containers there. It's always a big debate that's, that, that's hot on any online uh, stream. Yeah. So what about yourself, Sarah? So um, basically, uh, the team that I used to run at the FT uh, is content publishing and delivery platform. Mm -hmm. So we had adopted a microservice architecture about four years ago and we got to the point where managing a lot of microservices is costly because we were running one per VM and uh, complicated. So we looked at containers and we basically adopted uh, Docker in probably 2014, it was quite early. Yep. Um, we've subsequently, we sort of built our own container stack at the time, we subsequently migrated to uh, run on Kubernetes. Excellent. I mean, this is a journey I've been through as well, so um, working at several large uh, online e-commerce places, it's a, it's a thing you have to go through the pain yourself, building it, and then eventually get into a place where it's nice and comfortable. Yes. So, um, back to you, Sarah. Also, I just want to say, it's, it's really nice to have a fellow Brit on the stream at the moment. Um, <laughs> I feel like there's some solidarity going on. So, um, can you tell us about um, what sort of things you do with containers at, at the FT? Uh, tell us about your workloads that you have. So for content, I mean we use containers in lots of places, but for content publishing, um, the workload we've got actually isn't that high. Uh, in terms of how many articles that the FT publishes a day, it's, it's in the under, under a thousand. Yeah. Um, so, it's, so mostly we have multiple instances for resilience rather than for load. And, and also for our, um, for our websites and, the, and our APIs, actually we offload a lot of things through cache because with content, you're mostly reading it. We do have some personalization stuff, but for anything that's an article, effectively, it doesn't change. So we, we are using containers to complement our microservices approach, and we're using microservices because we get to move so much faster. So we went from 12 releases a year to over 2,000 for that team. Uh, wow. And that's, an, that's transformational in terms of how you can deliver value to, to your um, business. Excellent. And uh, let's let's talk about Fargate a minute. Um, Fargate's one of my favorite services. So I used to be a, a big S3 nerd, and um, until Fargate came out, and that, that really excited me, and it was like, this this tech is amazing. Um, just a container and run. So how's it changed your, your processes? At, um, oh, well, it, it, it's been awesome, because it's actually been able, we've been able to uh, kind of continue using the processes that we developed in building up our Lambda functions. Um, and basically, we manage our Fargate containers almost the same way that we uh, that we manage our uh, our, um, our Lambda functions. It's it's uh, the orchestration is identical. It's it's wonderful in that regard. And what do you use for orchestration? Are you using Jenkins or Code Deploy or? I well, it, it's a system that we've developed ourselves um, in conjunction with Step Functions. Okay. And I mean, today's announcement with Step it, with, with uh, being able to support Fargate directly through Step Functions that's huge for us. Because, I mean, we developed the entire infrastructure to be able to use Fargate from within a step function. And now we don't need to worry about that anymore. It's great. Excellent. I mean, um, so what about yourself? What sort of um, tools do you use to actually do the deployments of, of Kubernetes in the first place? Um, so for our... Um so, so basically for our applications, we're using a Jenkins pipeline. We're using Helm charts to, to oh, deploy nice them. Helm. Uh, that's been very straightforward to us. We, previously, we were using uh, Systemd. So it was actually very, very like-for-like -like swap. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> Hel Helm's a better place to be though, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, can you tell me more about how your platform works today and, and how, how much of a change it is from where you were a few years ago? Uh, so, as I said, we, we move so much quicker. Uh, we've gone from uh, one monolith to 150 plus microservices. And this is just one part of the FT. I think across the FT we probably have three or 400 microservices. Um, the speed of uh, delivery is much higher. Uh, we've got a much more consistent approach across all of our services um, because, because we're using containers. Um, and, and actually, it just we've definitely adopted the, the de DevOps approach because our development teams are doing everything. They, they built the platform, they maintain it, and then they yeah. write code to deploy on it. So that's a massive change from where we were, say, five years ago. Awesome. So we've got some uh, good questions coming in from Twitch, and if you've got any questions you want to put to, to the hosts here, um, just let us know. We've got an excellent panel of moderators down here. So uh, we'll take some of those questions now. So I'm going to start off, and um, so Financial Times, how does AWS help you run your infrastructure and build your platform more quickly? What, what were the key wins for you, I guess? Well, obviously, the more that you can get someone else to do the work for you, the better. So, <laughs> so uh, five years ago, we, we, we basically ha had servers that we'd get in and we'd configure, and it could take 120 days to yeah. do that. And of course, they weren't the same because they were all being done manually. So we, we first of all broke, built our own private cloud, which I think a lot of people did. I've um, been there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we had, a, we had a deployment platform that sat on top of it, and, and that made things quite easy. But we introduced AWS into it in 2014, and just have made a massive, massive shift to run on, on AWS rather than in our own data centers. And we're, we're basically aiming to decommission those data centers in the next year or two. Wow. We're well on the way to that. All in. Uh, yes. That's great, fantastic. So um, one of the questions here, um, we're talking about the, uh, what are the challenges um, processing that amount of um, observation Earth data um, for Skywatch, uh, and how does Fargate help you do that? How big are these data sets that we're talking about? I, some of the data sets that we ingest, compressed, are in the range of 10 gigabytes. Okay. Right, and so, and so we have processes that run in Fargate that, that, that stream these files into, into S3 um, and allow us basically to, to go into their metadata and then index them so we, so we can put them into our index and then this way when our, when our customers request certain satellite data, you know, they, they, give a, they give a location of the time period that they're interested in, uh, we, can, we, can access it, we can access it right away and process their data and have their end products available to them in minutes. Awesome, so cost reductions, moving to containers, moving to serverless yourself and containers and Fargate. Yeah. How's that helped? Um, I know where I come from on this standpoint of view. I've done many projects where consolidated lots of uh, EC2 instances into containers, got better density, got better bang for the book, for want of a better word of uh, that. How have you found it? So moving from deploying uh, one microservice per VM to running on containers, uh, we, we went down to eight pretty large VMs and it was about a 40% reduction in our AWS costs. Wow. And, and when we moved to, to Kubernetes, because we could simplify uh, some of our process, we, we got another 20% reduction. So it's 60% overall reduction in AWS costs by making those moves to containers and then to Kubernetes. So I guess one of my, my personal questions, I'm ignoring the Twitch stream, sorry Twitch. Um, I love Kubernetes, I love containers, so it's a, <laughs> it's a nice way to dive in and get some, <laughs> some, um, some really good uh, answers from uh, another expert in the industry. And, um, do you run multiple clusters for different environments of Kubernetes, or are you one of these who prescribe to run everything in one huge cluster <laughs> and use namespaces and C groups to simplify? Well, so the, the FT is very uh, diverse in terms of teams uh, pretty much choose their own technologies. So in fact, this we have got a couple of separate Kubernetes clusters for different teams. We've talked about using namespaces to run our staging and production uh, clusters in one namespace. I'm, I'm not sure we're convinced that's something we want to do. Yeah, and you but started your Kubernetes journey before EKS was available, so yes. um, from experience, um, building that yourself, there's a lot of heavy lifting. Um, RBAC, for example, role-based authentication. It's, it's not for the faint-hearted, should we put it that way, so EKS has really, really simplified doing things like that, and you may be looking at that in a few years' time, or? I, I think uh, it's, a, it's, it's an easy decision if you're doing it from scratch. Once you've invested in building a platform, but I can't see any reason why we wouldn't look at uh, yeah. managed, uh, managed Kubernetes or, or even uh, ECS back with Fargate. I, I'm not entirely sure where we'll go. Um, we are 
comfortable running a Kubernetes platform because what we had before, we'd written ourselves. Yeah. So obviously that's easier, but I think using EKS would be easier than that. So um, this is a question for you both, really. Um, do you use the global infrastructure? Do you run your containers in multiple regions? Yes, so we so what we have at the, the FT is we say anything that is a brand critical application yeah. must run in multiple regions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because because we don't want to risk that, that something goes down because we lose a, a, a lose a region. Yeah. Uh, right now, no. I, I mean, we have everything winning in one, in one region, but multiple availability zones. Well, that's a sensible thing to do for yes. a start. <laughs> I, I'm guessing as well you might have restrictions on where you can process your data, and is there anything I, like that? Well, no, it's not like that. I think it's it's just where we are in terms of our size, right? I mean, I, I mean, we're definitely thinking about uh, thinking about how we scale, and 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 multi-region redundancy will be a, will definitely be a big part of that. So, it is. Okay. A, it's an unnecessary complication when you're starting. I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, uh, there's some uh, interesting questions coming from Twitch at the moment. So, um, uh, using tools like Kubernetes and Fargate to simplify um, deployments, um, how's that changing the DevOps role? I'm putting this a lot uh, in a lot nicer way than was coming from the, uh, the stream. When you say DevOps our, role? Uh, you, well, the operations uh, role. Uh, are, are operations dead? I hope not, because that's my background. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in charge of operations at the FT, so I hope not to. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a first line operations team, mm -hmm. um, but we also expect our delivery teams to be available and running the stuff that they build. So the first line are there pretty much to, to help out and work out exactly where the problem is. Because actually when you have a microservice architecture, sometimes even working out who, which team has to look at the problem is, is one thing. And I always like to say the, the operations roles change in a little bit. It's, um, not so much about building and worrying about the monitoring infrastructure, that's there for us, we can consume that. Um, but it's more about how application A talks to application B, and it's, it's kind of evolved into a more um, architectural role, I'd say. It's an evolving job, and from an operations point of view, if you're not automating yourself out of a job from day one, you're not doing it right, is, uh, yeah. is kind of a philosophy Absol to go. On. Absolutely. I, I mean, like in our case, we don't have a DevOps person. I mean, our engineering team is about 12 people, um, and, and from the beginning we said the developers were responsible for the operations of the services that they own. Um, so I mean, they're the ones getting the call at 2 a.m. if something's not working. So, so, but I mean, I mean, it's been great. I mean, like you know, we've uh, we've in, we've integrated some CI tools. Uh, we use we use serverless as a, as a deployment template for our services, um, and it's been working really well. Um, we haven't missed the DevOps person at all. Fantastic. Sorry to say. I just want to jump in and say, so we've, we've got teams doing uh, tooling around observability and operations yeah. to make sure that, that we support all of our delivery teams. So that's where Ops is moving into. It's the kind of cross everybody, everybody who's a developer at the FT, we're building tools that are useful for all of those people. And there is that, there is that philosophy of you build it, you run it, but there's still tooling, there's still things underneath that need to be looked after, security of containers, yeah. for example. So. Yeah. It's always there. Um, mm -hmm. Don't worry, ops, ops teams, um, <laughs> your, your job's safe still for quite a while. Um, so, uh, this is another Kubernetes one, I apologize. We'll get to a bit of Fargate <laughs> in a minute. I'm going to ask you about Ground Station and how excited you are about oh. that. Um, so, how do you manage your global Kubernetes clusters um, without having a global control plane? Is that a challenge at the moment? We basically treat them uh, pretty much as separate clusters, to be yeah. honest. And we were, we were doing that already before we introduced Kubernetes. We've got, the, the data storage that we've got isn't uh, clustered across uh, across the regions anyway. Because the so, cluster API is very new, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, yeah. Still so we yeah. just treat them as two separate, we treat them as two separate clusters effectively, but we do monitoring to make sure that they're consistent for the things we really care about. So when we publish, when someone publishes an article, we make sure that it makes it to both, both regions yeah. and, is, and is the same. Excellent. So, um, right, let, let's dive into yeah. a bit of Fargate. Let's, <laughs> let's give you a chance here. Um, like I say, Fargate is one of my, my favorite um, services. It just yeah, made- It's become one of our favorites too. It made <laughs> it so easy, didn't it? It's, yes, um, it does. It, yes. It, it really, really simplifies container management. I, I, I mean, I know in a, in a previous li lifetime, I managed a Kubernetes cluster as well. Um, and, and I know how hard that is. And I mean, I'm a developer. I'm not a DevOps person, yeah. right? So, so I, I, I mean, Fargate, is like a breath of fresh air. I, I mean, all you have to do is worry about the container and and just run a task, and there it is. And, it's and have you found that's reduced your EC2 footprint as well by going into containers? I, 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 into you know, we, we never we never had a big EC2 footprint to begin with, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but it, it definitely has reduced it. 
Yeah. Right. And I'm guessing both of you have this advantage. Um, the huge advantage of containers and serverless is that we can focus on our applications, um, especially when you start using Fargate. I mean, yes. Fargate for this is you focus on the code, you put it in a container, yeah. you run it, and yeah. it's it's life changing. I mean. Yeah. You've got experience in this industry. Yeah. You've been there. You've oh, seen it. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've been in software development for 33 years, and I know how I know what a difference this makes. So, if you can think yeah. of like one sentence to say how much Fargate has changed your workflow, how can you sum it up that quickly? How much it's changed the workflow? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's it simplified it to a huge extent. I'm just, just massive. I think my word would yeah. be awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's great, and there's, there's quite a lot of open source tools as well, so you can get involved in there yeah. and run it very easy from the CLI. Which brings me to another question for Kubernetes. Yeah. Um, so, um, Twitter wondering if you use the, uh, the GUI for Kubernetes to, to run and manage it. Um, the dashboard project, I, I guess. No. No, no, all cube control all the way? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Good Command lines control. all the way down. That's, that's what I like to hear, yeah? Uh, <laughs> Black screen, green text. That's what we're talking about. I mean, to be to be honest, a lot of the stuff we we found when we've been to Kubernetes, lots of things are just uh, like it self heals. You know, there's much less hands-on work than there was when we were running something built on um, CoreOS and Fleet, which is what we had before. Okay, so um, we'll we'll have a couple more questions from Twitch and then we'll wrap up. So, um, how many clusters, uh, uh, Fargate clusters? Do you run one big one, or do you um, do you have multiple environments? No, no, no. no we, we have we have multiple clusters. I I, I like we, we use Fargate for uh, for a number of different processes in our in, in our workflow. Um, ingestion is part of it, and also for part of the image processing, because because what we do is you know, satellite images are pretty big, and we break them down into small little pieces, and 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 process them as much as we can inside of Lambda functions. But somewhere along the line, you have to bring it all back together again. Yeah. And, and for, especially for some of the high resolution data that we work with, that has to be done in, in, again in a, Fargate, uh, in, in a Fargate cluster. And we tend to have different isolated clusters for those different functions. Okay, and, uh, and one last, last quick one here. So um, what AWS analytics and insights tools do you use at, at Skywatch? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, Kinesis Stream, Kinesis Firehose, um, uh, Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch. Yes. And do you use Elasticsearch service, or do you build that yourself? I uh, no, no. It's uh, we use the service. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. just starting to dabble into that, and it's, uh, it's yeah. a big learning curve actually. If you've never yeah. used it before. Uh, I, yeah. I, yeah. But but no, I mean I mean we we have some really smart data people in our team, and they figured it out. So yeah, it's pretty good. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. Um, I think we've actually got time to squeeze another question in, don't you? Um, so Twitch, do your worst. No, don't do your worst, <laughs> really. <laughs> so, um, right, let, let's go back into Kubernetes, just because I've got this uh, strange love affair with Kubernetes, uh, <laughs> even though it's caused me much pain. Um, with your ETCD and the backup, um, you're not using EKS, so there's a lot of hard work and management in that. Um, is that one of the things that might make your teams uh, convert to EKS in the future, do you think? I think it, basically anything that we can hand off to someone else is a massive benefit. Yeah. So, so yes. I mean, I, my ideal thing would actually be to hand over the control plane and the data plane to someone else and just concentrate yeah. on deploying containers. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah. So I, I roll know. on Fargate for EKS, yeah, basically. Yeah, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe you do need to use Fargate. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what you uh, what uh, announcements you heard this morning, but um, I was listening to the uh, the layers for um, yeah. for serverless and that that. That bridges my interest with containers and how containers work. We, and it's, we it's use serverless. World. We also use serverless a lot at the FT, so we're really excited by that. Yeah. Okay. So um, you know, we we definitely see different reasons to use serverless and containers. So yeah. it's uh, it's definitely something I expect people to use a Brilliant. combination. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here today. So um, we've got some more great sessions coming up today. Stay tuned to Twitch and um, keep your questions coming. Our mods love our, love the questions. A big shout out to Steve over there. Uh, and Brandon as well. Um, you'll see them on camera later, no doubt. And also, say hello to Rickbot. I mean, I'm, I'm famous now, I'm a real person, I'm not just <laughs> Lambda functions. I'll catch you later. Thank you. <laughs>